Well, it's great to be here with you to bring you the word. Uh, for those of you watching here at Gawler, uh, I'm preaching at Williamstown this morning, so I thought I'd record the message for you so we can keep going with the series that we're working our way through, which is called For Gawler. And if you're joining us online, whenever and wherever you are joining us, I'm so grateful that I could bring you the word and that you've taken some time to be able to uh, listen and explore what it means for God uh, to speak into your life. So as we jump into the word, why don't you pray with me today? Loving God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that it speaks into our life. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder, are you a, um, a person that likes to watch television, to watch movies, to watch TV series? Eloise and I, my wife, we have found that over the last, well, as long as we've been married, it's something that we have uh, grown to connect together whilst doing. We, both, we, we quite enjoy watching television shows, watching movies, talking about the plots and the subplots and the, the tone of the director and the videography, things like that that we really enjoyed. Uh, but one of the series that we have been watching most recently on Netflix, as it would happen, is a series called The Good Doctor. And it was a, a series, I've, I've never been one to be big on the medical drama sort of things. Grey's Anatomy's never been my thing, uh, anything like that. But this one captured my attention. And the reason is, is it's about a doctor uh, who has graduated med school and is just starting his um, intergy or residency, I think is the term they use. Um, but the thing that makes this doctor, uh, Dr. Sean Murphy, different is that he has autism or ASD. And the story begins, or the series begins, with navigating the complexities of what it, was, what it would be like to be a surgeon with a disorder, uh, a mental health disorder, as significant as the one that he has in that moment. And um, the actor does an extraordinary job. The actor doesn't have ASD himself, uh, and so he does an extraordinary job uh, reflecting uh, the condition that this young uh, man is meant to have. And it fascinated me because... Uh, he navigates problems within the context of the medical and, and, and surgery world in, a whole, in, in different ways than the, the other surgeons around him approaches problems differently, all that sort of stuff. And so the creativity of the story captured my imagination. Now that was in season one. And season two was a little bit more of that sort of stuff and lots of creative problem solving, things like that. But as the seasons progress, what I've started to notice, we're into season four now, just finished season four. As, this, as the series progressed, what I began to notice was the center place that uh, crisis and, and relational dysfunction started to, to take in the narrative of the overall show. The show became less and less about him and the complexities of him navigating that work environment. And it became more about the relational dysfunctions around him. But turned into a basically... A, a relational drama. And it got me wondering, why is that the case? Why is it that whenever we look at things, why is it that whenever we're watching things, invariably the directors and whatever seem to trend towards dysfunction, seem to trend towards crisis, trend towards bad news to such a degree that, to be honest, when I, as I'm watching this, I'm frustrated. I found myself growing frustrated by the relational dysfunction that I'm seeing in this show, yet I'm st that was two seasons ago, and I'm still watching that and enjoying it in many ways. So what is that about? And I think it's, it's something that the directors have recognized, and I talked a little bit about it last week, recognize something within us as human beings, that we are inherently attracted to dysfunction, to, to crisis. The bad news holds our attention and the bad news ultimately sells. It's a phenomenon that exists, has existed for I don't know how long, but it was, it was something that was very heavily captured in, um, in, by journalists and advertising media through the 50s and 60s, that as they started to promote things and as they started to capture news, what they noticed was to hold people's attention in an e era of distraction growing era of distraction, they had to increasingly report 
on negative stuff. And that's to the point now, the way you and I, when we turn on the television, it's all bad stuff. It's all bad news. We, I, I don't, to be honest, I don't really watch the news anymore. Why? Because it's depressing. Now, don't get me wrong, it's important to stay informed about what's going on in the world, but I've, I increasingly found that there was just this level of dysfunction that I was seeing in the world everywhere. And it was always being reported on. I found the contrast so vivid when I was uh, reading, I was actually stumbled upon a newspaper article with, uh, about my nana, so my mum's mum. Uh, and it was to do with the article, the local article in the borough uh, news was reporting about the local school picnic and what had happened there. And, and my nana won, the, um, won all the running events, which as it would happen were the sack race, the egg and spoon race, um, the three-legged race, and there was one other as well. But the point is, like, this was 1941. And she, or the experience that they had, what was reported on was just the joy of the experience. So what, what happened? That meant that our, our local reporting went from the good stuff to the bad stuff. Well, the reality is, in our 21st century world now, there's so much distraction. There's so much vying for our attention. The bad news is what always seems to run to the fore. And we as a church, we've been swept up in this. It seems that there's every time that Christianity or, or the church rises to the top of the news feed, it's invariably bad news. Whether it's the dysfunction of a local pastor or whether it's um, a, a church standing up for a certain um, ideological or religious or the theological view, a sociological view about something specific and appealing, everyone else needs to live by these rules. Why? Because the Bible says so. And everyone else is saying, well, we didn't ascribe to the Bible, so how, why are you telling us, why should the Bible tell us what to do? And every single time this happens, the, bar, the, the Christian church, and we are a part of that church, lands itself with extraordinary bad news. And so every time the church is mentioned in our culture now, it seems to be bad news. So we as a church, we didn't want it, that to be a part of our story. Certainly, I've got no intention and, and will do everything I can to avoid making the news for any sort of reason if I can. But really what we wanted to make sure of was that the stories that were told in our community about our church were not about what the church is against, but instead what the church is for. And so we as a church have decided that we want to be known for what we are for rather than what we are against. We want to be known for what we are for rather than what we are against. So that's what this whole series is about. And the, it's, it's a super practical series because it's really about creating a movement which helps us do the things that we need to do to be seen to be doing good things. Because in this era of the world, it's not, it doesn't seem to be enough to do good stuff. We seem to need to be seen doing good things. And so this, in a sense, is a bit like, or is, is a, that's, that's what this is all about. And the passage that, we were that I explored last week, which talked about and framed this whole thing, was from 1 Timothy 6, 7, 17 to 19. And it says this, it says, Command those who are rich in this present world, that's you and I, no matter how much we earn in the grand scheme of things, we are rich if we've got, if we've got a food to eat, a house, a car, friends, relationships, rich. In this present world, not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in their wealth. Why? Because it's so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. This was the Apostle Paul's teaching to Timothy as he was beginning his pastorate. What do you teach the people who are rich in this present world? Well, you teach them this. Be generous, be willing to share in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Friends, when we are rich in good deeds and generosity with what we have, 
We're laying it down a firm foundation for all that is to come in the life to come, but also we're laying it up now that we get to take hold of the life that is truly life. Because something that we know is true is that putting our hope in wealth ultimately lets us down. Paul says that hope in wealth, possessions, stuff, the things that we would consider make us rich in the world, hope in those things ultimately lets us down. They are so uncertain. So we've decided to do something different, which is to bless the community around us. And really, this Four Gawler movement is an exercise in radical generosity. It's one of our core values. And the reason that we have chosen an action of generosity is primarily because I believe generosity is the thing that cuts through the narrative of our selfish, broader culture, a culture that is all about us. I believe generosity cuts through that, and so that's what we are doing as a church. Now, if you, didn't, if you weren't here last week, make sure you go back and watch that video. Uh, it, I talk about the first of the three movements that we're doing together, and that is give. And give, it's a simple action. I'm asking everyone to give $25, flat $25. Why, what is that money for? Why? Why are we giving? We want to give it away to some uh, partnership organizations that we have chosen to work with and that we just want to bless because we love what they're doing. And so that's the Willow Men's Shed here in, uh, in Williston, Gawler Primary School, Gawler East Primary School, and You Care Gawler. Four organizations doing amazing work to bless our children, to bless uh, men in isolation, and to ultimately bless uh, those that are struggling uh, with making the everyday needs of food and accommodation and financial well-being met. People struggling with those, that's the sort of stuff that we're hoping to bless through this. And so we are, we are receiving $25 per person, and the aim is not to reach a monetary goal. The aim is to reach a participation goal, and that participation goal is 100%. I'm inviting every adult and children, if you want to, to participate in this. And the cool thing is all the money that we're receiving, we're giving away. Every fee that is, is, is accrued, every, um, all, all the fees, every, we're covering all of that as a church. And all the money that is received, every cent is going to go to the organizations that we have chosen. And so make sure that you, uh, if you haven't done that yet, make sure you jump online, go to our website, click the Four Gawler tab, and you can give through there. But I want to look at the second element today. So we've looked to give. I want to look at the second element today. And what I think ultimately f underpins that is the question, which you wouldn't kind of think is connected but it is more than we realize, and we'll discover why. What does it take to be truly great? What does it mean to be truly great, to have discovered and experienced greatness in the world? When we were growing up as children, that's what we wanted to be. We wanted to be great at something, at everything. We wanted to be known. We wanted to be significant. We wanted to be famous in some way whether it was great at basketball or the fastest runner in the playground or the one that could do the monkey bars upside down or whatever. As, as kids, it could have been silly little things. But as we grow up, that desire to be greatness actually sticks around in our hearts. And whether you realize it or not, you have that. I have that. That desire to be great, that desire to be significant, that desire for our life to matter, that desire to be noticed, for some of us, that's the desire to be famous, to leave an impact in the world. All of that can be encapsulated in this idea of what it means for us to be great. And as adults, it looks a bit different at the playground, well, most of the time. But in sports, it's getting to the Olympics or playing in professional sport like NBA or NBL or, or whatever. Or it might be getting a PhD and, and, and being published and, and achieving great things in academics, a Nobel Peace Prize, something like that. Or, or it might be in, in the realm of power, so in politics, or being super wealthy in a specific industry. It might be uh, influence, so having a platform, being a so on social media. Uh, it could be something like that. It could be um, having wealth and possessions. It might be achieving a certain lifestyle, or having a certain type of house, or for those of us that are parents or grandparents, it could be achieving the specific parenting picture of what a great parent looks like 
as that you see in, in Instagram, those, those, those dads that can work a full-time job and, and, and still be at every sports game and still read stories to their kids before bed and still help cook dinner and still have the car clean and still have the lawn mowed. And, or it's the mum that's got a full-time job and still able to spend super, read five books a day with their kids and spend super quality time together to, to still cook meals with the husband and to still have time together as a family around the table. Oh yeah, and by the way, to still um, make sure that everything around the house is done or to make sure that the husband's done it, whatever that looks like in your relationship. When, whatever that picture of Greatness looks like. It's there. It's always there. And we're pursuing it with everything that we've got. Rightly or wrongly, it is there. And the question's got to become, why is it there? Why is it there and is it a good thing? Is it ultimately worth pursuing or is it not? And if we delve a little bit closer and we think about it a little bit, if you're a person of faith, then we, then we can explore the idea just a little bit in terms on its own merits. So the idea is that we want to be great. And it doesn't seem to matter how hard we try, we keep pursuing, trying to be great about one thing or another. But, and we think about that we are, you and I, we're made in God's image. Made in the image of God. And so what that means is that The things that are within us, in a sense, are inherently good. And it seems that God hasn't chosen to take that that pursuit of greatness out of us, which means it stands to reason that we were made to pursue greatness for some reason. And so the problem, I think, is not that we pursue greatness in some form, The problem is not that we want our lives to matter in some way. I think the problem is that we go about doing it in the wrong sorts of ways. If we were to look back across human history at the pursuits that humanity has taken for greatness, you could write like a how-to book of it and recognize some key things, some key attempts that you and I or that humanity makes in terms of trying to pursue its own greatness. Let's have a look at one of them, at some of them. If I were to write a book, this is what it would be. Introduction. Treachery 101. Chapter 1. Use use corruption to gain wealth. Chapter 2. Identify your enemies. Chapter 3. Plant lies and undercut your enemies. Chapter 4. How to conquer the weak during hard times. Chapter 5. How to update your list of enemies with the people that really have it in for you. Chapter 6, how to earn the loyalty of the right people. And then maybe the second part of that chapter would be how to make the consequences of betrayal clear. Chapter 7, how to stir up dissension in the opposition. Chapter 8, how to marry the right person for personal advantage. Chapter 9, how to declare yourself king. And chapter 10, how to remove anyone that gets in your way, or perhaps off with their heads. But then, I think that's kind of, now that seems a little bit silly, a bit of hyperbole in some of it, but within that, I believe in some way, is, reflects the principles that you and I, in our, by our nature, pursue to try and be significant or find significance in the world. But the thing about it is, once for those, of the, for those that have found that sense of greatness that they were looking for, that have found the only ever job they wanted to do or have earned as much money as they could possibly earn, um, what they realize is that there's, a, there's an appendix at the back of the book. And it has, it has some of these in it. Appendix A, why is it so lonely at the top? Appendix B, is it really even worth it? Appendix C, living with the fear that you'll lose it all. Appendix, Appendix D, what do you do when you have lost it all? Appendix E, what happens to all that you've achieved when you die? Big, big questions. Big questions. But we've already acknowledged that the pursuit of greatness is not necessarily a bad thing, because I think we were created that way. 
So the problem is actually the way that we go about pursuing greatness. It's the way that we go about doing it. So the question becomes, is there a path to greatness that we can look to? Is there a path to greatness that does actually bring the meaning, purpose, and joy that we are meant to feel when we achieve significance in some way? And I believe there is. And we discover it when, by looking at the greatest, most significant person that ever walked the earth. And I know who you're thinking I'm talking about, Jesus of Nazareth. His presence on the world changed the calendar. You ever think about that? The most, one of the, I think the most significant event is the way that we track time. And the world has acknowledged that we have changed the way we track time based and track the years based on one man's presence in the world. Now, if that's not great, I don't know what is. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 writes about Jesus this way. He says, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. And that is the, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I tell you what, if that's not greatness, I don't know what is. That, that your name would be greater than everyone else's? If you want to talk about greatest of all time, we're not talking Michael Jordan or LeBron James we're talking Jesus of Nazareth. And that at that name, everyone would bow. And everyone would proclaim that Jesus is the Lord. That is what true greatness looks like. Paul tells us what he became. The greatest man to have ever lived. But the question we're not ask, asking, we're not actually asking the question, what does it look like to be great? Although that is pretty great. The question that we're actually trying to answer is, how did Jesus get there? And it's the word therefore in that passage. So it uh, invites us to look back a little bit further in Paul's writing. We're going to move back from verse 9 back to verse 5. And he writes, in your relationship, this is the how, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is the how. How did he become the greatest? Who? Being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, instead, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What did Jesus' pursuit of greatness look like? Well, it wasn't political manipulation and subterfuge and self-elevation. Jesus' pursuit of greatness was to make, was not to claim that which he had already had by birthright, equality with God. He was the son of God. He didn't claim that. Instead, he made himself human. And humbled himself by giving his life on a cross for you and for me, for the world, as an act of loving service to us. Christ leveraged what he had for our benefit. And because he did that, he was elevated to the highest place and given a name above every other name. Jesus' path to greatness wasn't a pursuit of greatness. It was a pursuit of service, of humbling himself, of le leveraging what he had at his disposal for a world that desperately needed his help. So in, in the economy of God, it's not the pursuit of greatness that's a bad thing necessarily it's actually how we go about doing it it's not about self-elevation it's about humility lowering ourselves and serving others 
And so it's, it's helpful, I think, to have that sort of understanding that it's great. To, greatness comes through service. But there's something else that I think I need us to notice. And that it's, it's not just enough to do the things that need to be done because it's not necessarily sustainable. Paul, Paul takes a slightly different tack. And again, we rewind just a little bit further to verse 3. And he writes, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Yep, it's humility, serving others. Not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. It seems that what Paul is trying to get at is that it wasn't just what Jesus did that mattered. It was his mindset that mattered, his attitude, the way that he saw the world, his disposition. And it was those things that drove him to do the greatest acts of service that would be ever required. I think it was able to drive him to serve even when it would cost him everything. So it seems that the pursuit of greatness is not just service. You want to be great? In the economy of God, it's not just about serving. It's about having an attitude of service. It's about desiring and it's about having a mindset that is completely oriented around it. And that's the thing about mindsets. Mindsets are a choice. Attitudes are a choice. We've ha we often have very little control over what it is that happens to us in our life. But we always have control over our response. I've talked about this before. So often we can react. We almost always regret that. Far better off to respond. And in responding, we consider, we think about. It comes from a place of choice. It's why some one person can experience the exact same result or the exact same situation as, as someone else. And one person is, is, experiences joy from it and other, someone else experiences crushing depression. Sometimes it comes from the way you choose to see the situation, not so much the situation itself. And so Paul seems to suggest to us that it's not just serving, it's having the mindset of wanting to serve others. Desiring to serve others is the path that we take to experience the greatness that God has in store. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I thought being great was going to be fun. Don't you? It's, it's meant to be fun. But this doesn't sound much like fun. It sounds, to be honest, like unrealistic idealism. And, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, you might, there'd be a whole bunch of different reasons you're watching this or you're present with us in the room. But when you think about this, you go, I don't know. So that's pretty idealistic. No one lives this way all of the time. But before you write me off, one of the things I want you to consider is that we all want to live this way all of the time. Or we actually want to move through the world as if everyone else is living this way. Let me, let me explain it to you. We want those around us to put us and our preferences first. We do, secretly. We want to put our loved ones first. We want their loved ones to be put first. We want a mindset of service to mark our family. We want a workplace where co-workers aren't just thinking of themselves all the time, are they? No, we want them to actually do the dishes that are in the sink rather than just leaving your coffee cup there and putting up a passive-aggressive sign on the boiler. You know what I'm talking about if you've worked in an office environment. We want to be a part of a community where people consider one another's needs before themselves, where people will help a neighbor who might need it, where people will consider how their choices impact one another. In fact, it's that value, friends, that underpins every successful social 
endeavor that humanity has ever undertaken. When we are not completely in it for ourselves, when we are seeking others and their benefit, it's actually what makes humanity work. And in a sense, this whole four Gaula movement is because we believe that the church should be great. I actually believe, I believe it. Think what you like. I believe that the church should be known for being great, significant, having positive influence in the world, having a positive impact in the world. But Scripture is so clear, so clear, that the path to greatness is through service, not self-elevation. And through having a mindset that we will serve the people around us, even when it costs us something. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you've already signed up for this. You've already decided that you're going to follow what Jesus does, and Jesus served. So, whether you realize it or not, you're kind of locked in to this. He chose the path of a servant for us, for our world, and we are called to do the same. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, this idea of serving others is, is optional. You can choose if you want to do it or not, but I believe that it works. I believe it is the most helpful way to experience fulfillment, joy, and significance in our life. It's not about gaining stuff to ourselves. It's the way that we serve and give to others. And I believe it is a better way to experience the flourishing relationships that bear lasting fruit in our lives. But at the end of the day, the choice is yours, whether you, whether you want to do it or not. So that brings me to the practical step for this Sunday. I've talked about the scriptures. I've talk, explained to you how and why and everything like that. Brings me to the practical step. This Sunday, we want to make a choice to serve the community around us, to show them that we are for them by the things that we're going to do. So we have created some opportunities for you and for me to sign up to do some practical things with and for the church, uh, the part partnerships that we have chosen um, to sponsor and to, to invest in. And so I want you to head to our church website. And on our website, there is a link, the Four Gawler link, and it gives you the opportunity to how do I serve? And that will take you to a form to sign up for the different service opportunities that we're going to have available over the next few weeks and months. And I'm looking forward to what that might mean, that we could just be present in our town and to show our town that we are for them. Friends, I believe that God is, has called us to greatness. But I do believe that greatness is not, doesn't come from us pursuing it by our own efforts, by pursuing and elevating ourselves. I believe greatness comes from the way Jesus modeled it for us, by giving and serving those that are not like us, those that are different from us, and those that are our neighbors and those that are around us. So would you serve with me as a part of our four Gawler campaign? And would we communicate to the community around us that we love them just as Jesus does? Let's pray together. Our loving God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the way that it speaks into our life. And, and God, I know that serving can be hard because life is complicated. There is so much going on and we don't even feel like we've got the time. But Lord, may we gain focus on the way that you served us. That whilst we don't feel like we've got 20 minutes, half an hour on a weekend to serve, Lord, you gave your life <laughs> to serve us. So Lord, help us to have the mindset, transform our minds to see the world the way you see it and to see our rhythms and gifts of life the way that you see it. That we are called to serve and through that service we will elevate your name above every other name. In your name we pray. Amen.